Hello and welcome to World Connect, your window to the world. The week gone by saw a major terror attack at one of the Europe's busiest airport in Istanbul. A series of attacks targeting trainee policemen on the outskirts of Kabul and a hostage situation in the diplomatic enclave of neighboring Bangladesh. Together, they focused the world's attention once again on the tentacles of terrorism and the need for humanity to unite and uproot the menace. Last week also saw trepidation growing in the UK and anxiety in EU over the uncertainty that a Brexit vote has brought to the region. In World Connect, we will tell you about the terror challenge and about all that has been triggered by the Brexit vote. Let's get started with the focus of the show. Terrorists lay siege at a cafe in Dhaka's diplomatic zone for hours, taking several hostage before security forces intervene to end the standoff. After Brexit vote in UK, repercussions begin to unravel. Rating agencies downgrade UK's credit rating. Over 4 million sign a petition calling for the second UK referendum. But Cameron rules out another vote. Scotland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar reject Brexit. Scotland's first minister says a second independence referendum for Scotland is highly likely. Five Tories in the fray in the race for David Cameron's successor, ex-London mayor and leading Brexit campaigner Boris Johnson rules himself out as a contender. Winner to be declared on the 9th of September, political turmoil deepens in Labour Party with rebellion mounting against Jeremy Corbyn. In the deadliest suicide bombing in Turkey this year, three suicide attackers kill over 40 at Istanbul airport. Turkish government blames the Islamic State for the attack. Its president, Tayyip Erdogan, urges world leaders to unite against all terror groups. Syrian refugees take to theatre in a neighbouring Lebanon to narrate their ordeals of everyday life, like finding a place, paying for residency papers and being discriminated in general as an outsider. South Asia saw a terror attack at an unprecedented scale in Bangladesh. In a major anti-terror operation, Bangladeshi security forces stormed a cafe in capital Dhaka's diplomatic zone and rescued several hostages on Saturday after an attack claimed by the Islamic State. Gunmen attacked the upscale cafe late on Friday and held many hostages, including foreigners, before police poured into the building to try to free those stuck inside. More than 100 commandos launched a rescue operation and brought the hostage crisis to an end. Rodrigo Duterte has been sworn in as the Philippines' 16th president. The provincial city mayor, known for his brash man-of-the-people style, pledged to crush crime, swept establishment rivals in May elections. Shortly after taking the pledge, Duterte delivered a short speech in which he promised a relentless and sustained fight against corruption, criminality and illegal drugs. Two Taliban suicide bombers killed at least 37 people and wounded around 40 in an attack on Thursday. The attack was carried out on three buses carrying recently graduated cadets on the western outskirts of Kabul. They were returning to Kabul from a training center in Wardak province and were about to go on leave. The first bomber targeted the bus carrying the trainee policemen and their instructors. A second bomber attacked 20 minutes later when policemen had arrived at the scene to help. A group of clerics in Pakistan declared marriages between transgender individuals permissible in Islam. The clerics said that they also have a right to be buried in Muslim ceremonies. Tanzim Ittihad e Ummat Pakistan, a clerical body in Lahore, said in its fatwa that transgender people also have full rights under Islamic inheritance law. In 2012, Pakistan's Supreme Court declared equal rights for transgender citizens, including the right to inherit property and assets. Imagine traveling seven days with thousands of sheep and goats and horses just to cast your vote. A Mongolian shepherd couple did exactly that. What's at stake for herders like them is land for their animals to graze. They want the grasslands to continue to be publicly owned and not fall into private hands. And their vote is there 
instrument of hope. Casting the vote is the duty of every conscious citizen of a democracy. While the urban elite of developing countries are criticized for not taking up this vital duty, the wandering shepherds in Mongolia traveled seven days to cast their ballot. We are from Herder Tugar. All of our generations were herders. Both my parents are herders. We are staying here to rest our sheep while we go to vote. After we vote, we are heading north. Accompanied by 2,000 sheep, goats and horses, the Park Vajavin Shatar Bathar and his wife undertook the difficult journey to make their voices heard. His family spends the year travelling around the Gobi Desert in search for pasture for their animals, maintaining a way of life largely unchanged for centuries. They firmly believe that for the betterment of their profession and life, it is their responsibility to elect the right government. We want politicians who are responsible for the people in the same way that we are responsible for our animals. The issue of privatization of pasture land was of prime importance to the herders. The government has debated whether to privatize the country's endless grasslands, now publicly owned and available for anyone to use. If Mongolia privatizes pasture land, nomadic herding would be limited and perhaps stop. It would be good to keep letting Mongolian herders travel and move around the country freely. Change starts with oneself. This is what the Mongolian herders believe in. They act on what they would like to change for the better future of their country. You can drive an SUV on it and pound it with sledgehammers, but it won't break, even though it is made of glass. That's what safety tests by China on the world's longest glass suspension bridge in the country show. China is out to prove the safety of its glass bridges after a glass-bottomed bridge in Shinuizai National Geological Park started to crack under tourists. A glass-bottomed bridge suspended 984 feet above the Zhangjiajie Grand Canyon in China's Hunan province went through a hard test before being opened to the public. Brave volunteers and staff took a crack at the safety of the glass structure by hitting some of the panels with sledgehammers. Uh, the overall thickness of the glass is 5 centimeters. We use a method of gluing together every panel to tighten the area between them. The thickness of every glass panel is 1.5 centimeters. None of the volunteers were able to smash completely through the glass, which mostly broke into pieces. They were then invited to walk over the shards and damaged panels. Later, an SUV was driven over them, showing the bridge's structural strength. When I see the ground, I feel a bit dizzy. I mostly will look in front of me. I won't dare look at the ground. I have a dizzy feeling. Safety has been an issue at another glass bridge in China. Last October, tourists at the Yuntai Mountain Park report cracks in a glass panel. Since then, the park's bridge has been closed for maintenance. Known for its picturesque mountainous landscapes with suspended bridges, this bridge in China is yet another futuristic design with proof of its sturdy make. The creators claim that the 300-meter-high and 420-meter-long glass bridge is the largest of its kind in the world. Europe continues to reel under the impact of Brexit. The Brexit vote may be done, but it is far from dusted because its repercussions are just beginning to show on UK, EU and the world. For starters, UK has been downgraded by rating agencies and many within the kingdom are regretting the outcome of the referendum. The majority in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Gibraltar shudder to think the consequences of a divorce from the EU. The question is, with the writing on the wall, can the clock be turned back? With the people of Britain having voted for an exit from the European Union, those within and outside have begun to feel the impact. With Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron back in London after attending an initial day of talks, EU's remaining 27 leaders discussed at a summit meeting in Brussels how to relaunch the European Union after the shock of Britain's vote. After the summit, the European Council president said that the bloc will not negotiate with Britain over its withdrawal until it receives a formal notification from it. Britain's withdrawal from the European Union must be orderly and there will be no negotiations of any kind 
until the UK formally notifies its intention to withdraw. The economic impact of the referendum is beginning to show on UK. Rating agencies, Fitch and S&P, have indeed downgraded its credit rating, meaning they think that lending money to the UK government is less safe than it was last week. The pound has dropped considerably against the US dollar, less so against the euro, and this is likely to stoke inflation in due course. Britain's status as the world's fifth biggest economy is under threat. Bank of England Governor Mark Carney has said that the central bank would probably need to pump more stimulus into Britain's economy after the shocking decision. The IMF has warned that Britain's decision has created significant uncertainty that will have repercussions within and without. Brexit has created significant uncertainty and uh, we believe this is likely to dampen growth in the near term, particularly in the UK but with uh, repercussions also for Europe and uh, the global economy. There were big falls in stock markets in the UK and around the world last Friday, although there have been considerable recoveries this week. With Scotland having backed staying in the EU, its First Minister Nicola Sturgeon dismissed the leave result as democratically unacceptable. She said a second independence referendum for the country is now highly likely. She had also made her case in Brussels for finding a way to keep Scotland in the European Union. On the lines of Scotland, Northern Ireland too had voted for Remain. Its Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness drew that the impact in Northern Ireland would be very profound and that the whole island of Ireland should now be able to vote on reunification. But Northern Ireland Secretary Theresa Williams has ruled out the call from Sinn Féin for a border poll, saying the circumstances in which one would be called did not exist. What is clear already is that European country that could suffer most from Brexit, perhaps even more than Britain itself, is Ireland. This is because Ireland is so heavily dependent on trade with Britain, far more than other EU countries. It is also the only EU country that has a land border with Britain. And if there is one place in the UK that definitely doesn't want to leave the EU, it's Gibraltar. Residents of The Rock voted overwhelmingly by 96% to stay in the European Union. Now Gibraltar's Chief Minister, Fabian Picardo, is exploding options to keep the territory in the EU despite the referendum. One option which Gibraltar is considering jointly with Scotland's First Minister is the so-called Greenland scenario whereby parts of the UK could maintain Britain's membership of the EU while other parts leave. The repercussions mean that many in Britain are regretting the outcome of the referendum and hope that the clock could be turned back. But even though the vote is not legally binding, indications as of now are that this one could be faith accompli, unless the writing on the wall changes in the three months, when the new British PM enters 10 Downing Street. The Brexit vote has also triggered a twin leadership race among the ruling Conservatives on the one hand and the opposition Labour Party on the other. While five Tories have thrown their hat into the ring and leading Brexit campaigner Boris Johnson has opted out of the leadership race, in the Labour camp, dissent is mounting against Jeremy Corbyn. So even as 10 Downing Street is all set to have a new occupant in the next couple of months, suspense is building up on whether Corbyn can survive the rebellion. It was a day of surprises a week after the Brexit vote as Conservatives on Thursday announced their plans with regard to Tory leadership race and Prime Ministerial candidacy. The biggest surprise came in the form of ex-London Mayor Boris Johnson ruling himself out as a contender for Conservative Party leader and the Prime Minister. Johnson was among the key figures who aggressively led the Leave campaign. He was seen as the hot favourite to replace Cameron, who announced his resignation after Britain voted to leave European Union in a 23rd June referendum. Despite being the leading public face of the Leave campaign, many feel that Johnson appeared to have concluded that he could not secure enough support within the party. Defection of a series of Tory MPs to a Gov camp might also have triggered the decision. That having consulted colleagues and in view of the circumstances in Parliament, I have concluded that person cannot be me. Johnson's announcement came after Justice Secretary and another key Brexit campaigner, Michael Gove's surprise decision of running for the leadership. Gove had been widely expected to back Johnson's campaign to become the next leader of the UK. I came reluctantly but firmly to the conclusion that as someone who had argued from the beginning that we should leave the European Union, and as someone who wanted to ensure 
that a bold, positive vision for our future was implemented, that I had to stand for the leadership of the Conservative Party. British Interior Minister Theresa May also launched her bid to replace Prime Minister Cameron and lead the Tories. May, who supported Cameron's Remain position ahead of the referendum, said that there should be no attempts to remain inside the European Union once the people's decision is out. Brexit means Brexit. The campaign was fought, the vote was held, turnout was high and the public gave their verdict. There must be no attempts to remain inside the EU, no attempts to rejoin it through the back door and no second referendum. After the nominations were closed formally, there were five candidates in fray including Work and Pension Secretary Stephen Crabb, the pro-Brexit Energy Minister Andre Leedsom and former Defence Secretary Liam Fox, as well as May and Gov. The winner of the contest is set to be announced on the 9th of September. Conservative camp is not the only one facing turmoil. The Labour Party is also grappling with the leadership battle. Former Shadow Business Secretary and Labour MP Angela Eagle appeared all set to challenge Jeremy Corbyn for the party leadership. Corbyn has been facing a growing revolt within the party. Eagle was one of more than 20 people to resign from Corbyn's opposition policy team. Many Labour MPs are angry at Corbyn for what they see as his lacklustre performance in the Remain campaign. Corbyn, a veteran hard-left Labour lawmaker, is unpopular with many Labour MPs who passed a motion of no confidence in him this week. But he commands strong support among party activists who helped him to take over in 2015. Terror struck Turkey again this week when suicide bombers fired and blew themselves up at the Istanbul airport, Europe's third busiest airport, killing over 40 people. The Turkish government is pointing fingers at the Islamic State, but its critics say it has only itself to blame. Without any discrimination, we reject terror altogether as well as all terrorist organizations and terrorists. We expect to see the same honorable stance from other countries as well. May the power of God prevent my nation from experiencing this kind of grief ever again. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan urged world leaders to stand against all terrorist groups. Erdogan's remarks came as Turkey defied pressure from the European Union to amend its anti-terrorism laws. Ankara said that a suicide bomb attack at Istanbul airport this week provided further vindication of its tough stance. More than 40 people were killed and over 230 injured in terror strikes at the Istanbul airport on Tuesday night. Three bombers opened fire to create panic outside the airport before two of them entered the building and blew themselves up. The third detonated his explosives at the entrance. Turkish officials said the three men who carried out the airport attack were of Russian, Uzbek and Kyrgyz nationality. The evidence, documents and findings we have obtained corroborate the predictions that this attack was carried out by Islamic State. The findings point to them. Wars in neighboring Syria and Iraq have fostered a homegrown Islamic State network blamed for a series of suicide bombings in Turkey. Turkey is blamed for not adopting a tough stand against Islamic State. Critics say Ankara woke up too late to the threat focusing instead early in Syrian civil war on trying to oust President Bashar al-Assad by backing even his hardline Islamist opponents. Turkey had been arguing that there could be no peace without his departure. Some analysts blame Turkey's foreign policies for opening the doors for terrorists. This looks like ISIL retaliating, taking a preemptive action against Turkey. I think one of the messages is ideological, you know. Why are you reconciling with a force that is, in our eyes, the enemy of Islam? Turkey's foreign uh, policy had some uh, ups and downs in, in recent years and uh, uh, many people Opposition parties, NGOs uh, accuse the government uh, of its because of its Syria policy uh, causing the security defects. The attack on one of the world's busiest airports, a hub at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, was the deadliest in a series of suicide bombings in Turkey this year. This year, two other terror strikes targeted foreign tourists in the heart of Istanbul. Even a second vote within months after a prolonged political uncertainty did not change much in Spain. The June 26th election concluded with almost the same results as in December last year. 
Acting Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy's popular party led the poll scenario with 137 seats, 15 more than last time's 122. Rajoy said the results gave him the right to resume office. Socialist Party, which secured second position with 85 seats in the 350-member parliament, has rejected proposals to form a grand coalition with Rajoy's popular party. The vote has failed to break six months of political deadlock since December's inconclusive poll. Austria's highest court has annulled presidential runoff election that handed another chance to Freedom Party's narrowly defeated candidate Norbert Hofer. The Constitutional Court held the election must be held again. The verdict comes a week after Britain delighted anti-EU groups, including the Freedom Party, by voting to leave the bloc. Hofer lost the May 22nd vote to former Greens leader Alexander van der Bellen by less than one percentage point or around 31,000 votes. The court found more than twice that number of postal ballots had been affected by breaches of the electoral court. Canada, the United States and Mexico mounted a fierce defense of free trade vowing to deepen economic ties despite an increasingly acrimonious debate about the value of globalization. The three leaders gathered in Ottawa for the North American Leaders Summit. The summit dubbed the Three Amigos holds significance being Trudeau's first and Obama's last. U.S. President Barack Obama and Mexican President Enrique Pena Nieto also took swipes at U.S. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump, who has vowed to renegotiate or scrap the North American Free Trade Agreement if he wins November's election. The three also pledged to produce 50% of their nation's electricity from clean energy by 2025. Chilean authorities have announced to implement a new law requiring packaged food products to carry the label high if they exceed the limits of sugar, saturated fat, sodium and calories established by the health ministry. While Latin America's developing economies have made inroads into tackling hunger, many nations are now grappling with growing obesity. According to Chilean health ministry figures, one in every 11 deaths are attributed to obesity. And here's a look at what else is catching attention elsewhere. Centuries have passed since Neolithic artists swirled colors on the cliffs of northern Somalia, painting cattle, giraffes and hunters carrying bows and arrows, to name a few. They vividly depict a pastoral history dating back some 5,000 years or more and are considered among the oldest rock art sites in Africa. But with paint fading and peeling off the rocks, a rocky future may well be in store for them. What they need is a rescue act with no further dithering. But that may be easier said than done. Art on the Rocks Somaliland's last keel houses paintings of Neolithic artists. Preserved in the caves for more than 5,000 years, the red and white swirls still remain brilliant depictions of the pastoralist history of the early humans. Preserved for ages, the sketches are unique and have a distinctive style. The paintings, some 50 kilometers from Hargisa, the capital of Somaliland. The works of art on the caves are considered among the oldest and best preserved rock art sites in Africa. Discovered in 2002, the site has gained popularity among tourists. This site was discovered in December 2002. It was, you know, the French and Somali people who was lived here. So they discussed, you know, that they, they want to 
they are searching for some arts, you know, or rock arts, you know, like that type, you know. This place was known as the home of devils. During a period of prosperity, local nomadic people used to live in peace with a jinn here. The journey to the rocks is not an easy one. To see the famed works of the ancestors, each year visitors take on a journey through a rugged terrain and travel with armed escorts. This does not deter tourists as they come in thousands to Laskil every year and the numbers are growing. Laskil is, is, is attracted many tourists from all over the world, Europe, uh, in uh, Asia, uh, and especially uh, Japan and, and, and uh, Taiwan and also in uh, America. The beautiful artwork, however, lacks funds for conservation. Somaliland is a self-declared region and the lack of recognition from world bodies makes funding difficult. Followed by centuries of isolation, the famed ancient cave art of the Somaliland now faces a rocky future, one to wait and watch out for. We are refugees and human beings, not animals. That's the cry of a Syrian refugee in Lebanon, and she is not alone. Several like her have taken to theatre to narrate their ordeals of daily life in their country of refuge. All they want to know is, are you listening? Refugees have taken to theatre to portray their feelings and emotions they deal with. Feelings of pain, rejection, abandonment, loneliness, grief that they deal with in everyday life turns into stories and narratives. The stage for these Syrians in neighboring Lebanon is their minivan. The project, named Karva, travels through the refugee camps in Lebanese cities, towns and across its countryside. We divided 300 refugees into 20 groups and I worked with each group for about two weeks. During these workshops, people told their stories, and from there we recorded some personal stories, which were later put up on social media. Gesticulating widely and engaging with fellow refugees from the makeshift stage, the young actors perform a collection of stories about the challenges of daily life as a Syrian in Lebanon. The problems of finding a place, paying for residency papers, being discriminated in general as an outsider, the migrants bring out their troubles in the narratives. The Syrians acting in this play are telling our collective story. I hope the Lebanese and the entire world will listen to us. We are refugees and human beings, not animals. The young actors tell their personal stories written in storytelling workshops. A voice of the forgotten, a revelation of the unseen. Theatre for Syria's youth lets them have their say. This brings us to the end of this edition of World Connect. Please do share your feedback with us on the show. You can write to us on worldconnect.ddnews at the rate gmail.com. You can also connect with us through our Facebook page. But before we leave, watch how goats are striking a pose in a pageant in a Lithuanian village. A female goat named Demite was crowned the most glamorous of them all. With that, I and the entire team of World Connect will take your leave. Thanks for watching.